Hi, everybody, and um, welcome to Artificial Intelligence and Deep Learning for Enterprise. We're an AI ML meetup focused on taking things into production, you know, when businesses take AI and use it to create value for their customers. So this is number four of our meetups, and yeah, we've got some really exciting talks for you this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for this evening, um, Imran, who is from uh, Link S. The, I'm struggling with that one. Links XR Founders Network. He's talking a little bit about um, what these guys do to support um, startup founders in the, the uh, technical space, not just AI and ML. Um, and then we're going to get started with our talk for the evening. So I'll hand over to you, Imran. Thank you very much. You can you hear me? Ah, oh, perfect. Um, good evening, and uh, thank you everyone uh, for uh, joining us today at this uh, amazing event uh, about AI and deep learning. I'm Imran Chowdhury from Linksar Founders Network. Um, but before I talk about Linksar Founders Network, I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, you uh, for organizing this uh, amazing event uh, and giving us the opportunity to talk about Linksar Founders Network. Uh, we are a founders network, a uh, startup network uh, that provides uh, uh, free support and help to startups uh, worldwide. Um, uh, most of our uh, startups at the moment are currently in the UK, uh, not by design, it's just that we are based here. Um, we understand the challenges uh, and difficulties that uh, startups face, especially at the uh, early stage of, of early stages of their journey. Um, and that's the reason why we started uh, Link Up Founders Network, um, with the vision to create a, uh, a startup ecosystem that fosters innovation, collaboration, and growth for startups. Um, uh, Links Our Founders Network is a nonprofit network. All of our uh, benefits are completely free. Uh, our main purpose is to uh, promote uh, startups. Um, uh, for us, it's very, very important that uh, Whatever we do, uh, we do it for the startups of specific uh, specific ecosystems or uh, stakeholders are also uh, welcome. Um, um, one of the core pillars of Links Our Founders Network is uh, to provide uh, support to startups at every stage of their journey, uh, from uh, idea conception at the pre-launch phase to uh, to launching a startup. And then uh, from initial growth to uh, to scale, um, our network is designed to help um, ambitious uh, founders uh, to uh, in setting up and running successful, sustainable businesses. Uh, in a nutshell, we are here to support um, uh, you to access uh, your entrepreneurial superpowers, and also to break down barriers uh, to starting and uh, scaling uh, a startup. Uh, I'd love to tell you more about uh, 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 Links, our founders network, but we have very limited time. Um, and we have amazing speakers this evening who share their valuable insights about AI and deep learning, and I'm so looking forward to it. Um, thank you for your attention. Um, uh, please have a look at our website, uh, especially our uh, global directory uh, startups uh, to know more about us. Uh, and please uh, connect uh, with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but if we do, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh Sorry, we, I'm not sure we have time for questions on that one. Um, oh, sure. Okay. Talk, but thank, thank you so much for um, talking to us about things like Link XR today. Um, you can find out more in the link in the meetup invite, which um, will take you to Link XR's website to tell you all about what they're about. But um, thank you, Imran, and um, thanks again. Thank you. So, thank you, Imran. Uh, if you'd like to speak at one of these events as a presenter, then we have a request for proposals form on um, Google Forms. So. Uh, check that out. It's also in our Google Meet if you're interested. Um, we like to welcome uh, all sorts of speakers from um, all sorts of technical backgrounds and experiences with presenting. So do check this out. And one final thing, um, Demon are hiring in a variety of roles. 
Uh, so if you're looking for a role in technical consultancy, please do check that out. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first presenters of the evening from NatWest, um, Lucy Thomas and Yudanka Adanka on Enterprise Scale MOPS at NatWest. And I'm just going to grab you guys from here. <laughs> I'm Yudanka Ivanova and I work as a machine learning engineer at NatWest and today Lucy and I would like to take you through our little journey through machine learning operations at NatWest. So before I dive into ML I want to spend about a minute talking about um, what NatWest does if you're not familiar with, with the bank. So uh, NatWest is the UK's leading business and retail bank so we work with around 19 million customers across the UK and I think statistically we work with around one in, one in four, four businesses um, in the UK. So quite a lot of um, impact there. Uh, in terms of staff, we have around 60,000 employees worldwide and 3,000 models, machine learning models. Um, our data scientists and data engineers are about 500 and that number continues to grow a lot uh, over the past few months especially. So just deep diving into machine learning solutions straight away, we all kind of know how machine learning development begins, so we probably have a data problem and we want to solve it using uh, Python, very often Python, but it might be another programming language. And we will start writing some machine learning code, maybe in a Jupyter notebook, maybe in another kind of ID. And we train a model, we will evaluate it, and then we'd like to kind of take it to production if our proof of concept works. I think what we often forget about is when it comes to productionizing any software, there's a lot of different components that come into play. So starting from configuration of our environments to, um, to data collection, then serving infrastructure to make sure that we can actually scale our machine, learning sorry, our machine learning solutions and then making sure that we can monitor our, our machine learning models in production is also equally important. So how do we kind of bring together all these components to make sure that we can scale out our machine learning operations well, at NatWest, we've been on a bit of a journey in the past four years. Um, to begin with, what we looked like, uh, what our machine learning operations looked like four, uh, four years ago, we had um, disconnected environments. So our data scientists and data engineers worked in silos, and there was kind of a, m a really bad manual handover process where you tend to speak with data scientists or data engineer to kind of figure out what's happening and how we connect our environments and then um, in terms of the uh, productionization, it will take a really long time to then speak to model risk and get your model to production. Um, our data discovery was quite difficult because the bank has a lot of data stores um, all over um, kind of different environments again. <coughs> so the data access was pretty difficult and finally technology was outdated and uh, kind of fragmented in different environments as well. So to tackle these challenges, we um, used a modern tech stack, we simplified our data access, we optimized our governance, and we standardized, uh, <coughs> sorry, we standardized our patterns. Sorry, just have a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to show you our ma maturity curve here to paint a schematic picture of where we were, to begin with, um, we had our disparate environments and we were at the very start of our journey about four years ago. If you look at the metrics on the right hand side, you'll see that um, it used to take about 12 mo uh, months to go to production on our platform. And it would take around five days to get access to any data, data asset because you wouldn't know where to look for it in the first place. And it would take about three to six months to actually start handing over a machine learning model to production. And that would probably be handled by a different team altogether. Um, our, our environments were so kind of disconnected that sometimes it would take 30 days um, to actually request an environment. You'd have to speak to a platform engineering team and that team would have to investigate exactly what you need and then provision it on premise or in the cloud, which could take up to a month. So this is where we were about four years ago and just to see how we've kind of tackled over our, our challenges. 
this is a very AWS heavy talk, so there will be around 10 minutes for questions later, so feel free to ask us about it. But essentially, starting on the left-hand side, we have the service catalog, and this is where um, our shared infrastructure lives. So starting from a, a new use case, wanting to use machine learning on a project, what they'll do is they'll speak to the platform team, and that platform team will um, use the service catalog to provision shared infrastructure. That includes things like uh, container registries um, on AWS and a product that's called the service catalog, uh, which is another AWS service that gives you essentially um, out of the box infrastructure components that you can use in different accounts. So you'd go in and request the, the platform uh, team to provision that inf infrastructure for you. And what you also get is you get three accounts. You get the development, the test and the production account. Again, the platform team will provision those for you. And once all of that is done, um, you can start developing within SageMaker Studio in your development account. Uh, and when you're done with the whole machine learning development workflow, you would use um, <coughs> CI CD processes that come out of the box um, that will allow you to move your solution to the testing production environments. So just to go through the steps that you need to, to follow uh, at NatWest to request an account and then productionize your model. First, you will speak to the platform team and what they will do is um, they will use Terraform to provision all of your infrastructure and um, with that, they will also give you access to the shared service catalog, uh, which comes pre-packaged with all the infrastructure that you need. Now, this process on the left takes about two hours. So I spoke about how it used to take about 30 uh, 30 days to provision an environment. Now it takes about two hours and it brings up production accounts for you as well. And then once you have access to that, you can start using the service catalog in your own account and provision um, SageMaker Studio. So we mainly use SageMaker for uh, machine learning development because it really is kind of like a one-stop shop, as Lucy will say, for machine learning development. Um, you can do feature engineering, you can use feature store, you can also evaluate models. So it gives you so many features that you just don't need to actually go out of SageMaker Studio when you're working on a machine learning project. So um, what will happen is then the technical lead will provision a service catalog product with the SageMaker domain, and then they will create a, a user profile for each of the team members in, uh, in SageMaker so that they can start um, interacting and collaborating on projects. Um, now, one cool thing that this platform team has also built in for us is when you go into SageMaker, you can actually create um, your code base based on a set of pre-built pre code templates. So when you create a, a project in SageMaker Studio, you can choose from one of, I think, three or four uh, pre-built code templates, like ones for, for example, for LGBM models. Um, so what happens is, it will provision um, that code base for you into your Git repo, and then you can start using it straight away. So if you don't know SageMaker very well, you don't know how the SDK works, you don't really need to worry too much about it because the platform team has already kind of made it very easy for you to learn how to use it. And then finally, so we've kind of touched upon how you can create a project, how you can, how you can evaluate it, how you can take it to production. The, the last thing you need to do, the last thing you need to do is you need to log in as a model approver into our platform, go into SageMaker again, and then look at the metrics for your model. So the model registry in SageMaker is quite powerful for visualizing the met evaluation metrics that your team has gone through to, to see if your model is fit for purpose. And you can essentially validate that in SageMaker registry, approve the model, and that will start the promotion process to the test and production environments automatically. So all of this is not really possible without um, the right roles and permissions in place. And especially in an enterprise setting, you need to be, and in a bank, you need to be very careful about access to your data. Um, so we have created an RBAC model or a, a model with, with different IAM roles that give us um, only the permissions that we need to do our day-to-day -day jobs. So starting on the left-hand side, we have uh, the platform support engineer, and that role is really just for um, BAU tasks. So you, you can do 
monitoring of your machine learning solutions. You have access to things like CloudWatch logs and CloudWatch dashboards. So um, that rule really is just for that purpose and it is read only um, as opposed to the platform fixed engineer. And that is more of an elevated permissions rule and you can request it. I think it will take some time before it is approved and then, <coughs> sorry, and then you can uh, start looking at maybe changing some build scripts, for example. And on the right hand side, um, you have the technical lead, the developer and the model approver. The technical lead is the person that interacts with the service catalog and provisions the products um, into your account. And then you have the developer that's like a blanket rule for SageMaker Studio where you can collaborate on code. And finally, you have the model approver that just logs into model registry, approves the model and it starts um, going to production. So I think now I'm going to hand over to Lucy to speak about SageMaker Studio. Thank you. Danny. Um, so Danny's talked about the project templates and sort of the quick start things that make it easy for data scientists. And she also mentioned that SageMaker Studio is like a, a one-stop shop for data scientists or really anyone working on ML code. Um, and part of the reason it's a one-stop shop is SageMaker projects. Um, so these allow you to sort of package up like template code, um, but also you can deploy infrastructure with the use of a SageMaker project or from within SageMaker Studio. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about now the, the experience for a data scientist or a data engineer who's using our platform um, since Danny sort of covered over the whole platform um, and how we address those challenges. Now we're looking at more a user perspective what it's like to actually work in this platform and try and actually develop uh, a machine learning product. Um, so the data scientists would start off in SageMaker Studio, um, they just go click on create project and then enter a bit of information like the, the, you know, the name of the model for example. Um, and with that, uh, this sets off deployment of a few things. So um, you first of all get three S3 buckets uh, so one for data, one for models, one for artifacts. Um, and then you get two code pipelines as well. Um, so these are basically used for CI, CD, things like running unit tests um, or just formatting, checks, linting. So those are run as part of those AWS code pipelines. And again, that's all set up ready for you. So you don't have to think about that as a data scientist. Um, and then finally, as Dan mentioned, we've got a, a template code base that gets copied into your Git repo. And it means that um, as I said, if you're not very familiar with the SageMaker SDK, like there's quite a lot of boilerplate, but it doesn't matter too much because we've set up this template pipeline and you really can go in and start editing and just put your, your code into place in the pipeline steps. So it's a lot easier um, than sort of having to try and think about, first of all, all of this infrastructure that gets deployed for you. Um, and then also actually some of your machine learning code is done for you and ready, uh, already. Um, so once that gets deployed, um, as a data scientist, you're then free to work in a sort of pretty familiar Jupyter Lab sort of environment. Um, so that's what SageMaker Studio is like. Um, and you can run notebooks there, but you can also then edit and run scripts or uh, you can run SageMaker pipelines, which I'm going to talk a bit about in a minute. Um, and the sort of benefit of having this template code base for us is that we've been able to set quite high standards for um, Things like, you know, we want people to, to run unit tests, but it's really easy to leave that out and sort of forget about it. Um, so in the template code base, we've already got the sort of structure ready, so it's really, really easy to do that. Um, the same with sort of, you know, we set up pre-commit hooks for things like um, formatting or linting, just to, to say it's really easy, like it's already there, you don't need to think about it, just do it. Um, so all of these things, trying to sort of embed those high standards. Um, and also have people working in this same structure um, to make it a bit easier. We've got loads and loads of data science teams at NatWest. Loads of people probably working on very similar problems, but when you're all working with a completely different structure and in you know, different infrastructure as well, it's really hard to compare your code and see that you actually are doing very similar things. So um, it really helps to have that, that similar project structure and you can just sort of compare things very easily. Um, so I've mentioned SageMaker pipelines a couple of times and that template code base, it's, it's code for SageMaker pipelines. Um, 
So we have a training and an inference pipeline as part of every project as standard. Um, and this, you know, once you you set up that quick start template, you can then run this pipeline. This is just an example one, but one a bit like this um, immediately. So like I was saying, you can just replace a step. For example, you could just put your pre-processing script into there and run it, add a different training step later. You don't need to worry too much about actually setting up the whole pipeline. Um, and the benefit of this for different teams is that if you're in a team who has a few different use cases going on, you're all using kind of similar data, you might have a really uh, similar first pre-processing step and it's really easy to just pick up the code from that and run it in someone else's pipeline, but with a different training step, for example. Um, so it's really nice to have the code running in containers like this in nice decoupled steps. Um, and we just wanted to show a bit what, so, so we've said that there's a bit of boilerplate code and this is the sort of thing that we're talking about. Um, so for example, to set up a pre-processing step in the SageMaker pipeline, um, this is the, the code that would do that. And it's not really complicated, but you can see there's like a fair bit of it. And once we're inside uh, you know, the bank's networks, then there's actually quite a lot of config that we need for security as well. It's all a bit, you know, it's going to be tedious if you need to set it up every time. So this is what our templates are sort of taking care of. Um, it's all still editable, so people can change things, but it's just to get you started. And then, again, for, for setting off an, or well, defining an overall pipeline, um, it, it's pretty simple again, like you're just saying which steps are involved in the pipeline and the, the steps list at the bottom there. But you, know, you don't necessarily want to have to think about that whole thing at this you know, early on in a project. Um, but we've tried to make it a bit easier so that you don't really need to think about it too much. Um, and then another benefit, <laughs> sorry, it's been a bit funny there, the benefit um, of this as well. So running in pipelines like this, uh, the code's running in containers which get spun up at runtime and then once the code finishes running, they get spun down again. Um, so it means that we're only using them for the time that we actually run our code. Um, and compared to the cluster architecture that we had before, um, we're, we're using about 50% about of the time and then about 75% less carbon emissions, um, which is obviously a huge benefit and it's really important for us. We have kind of the goals as a bank that we want to reach. Um, and obviously if we're running you know, clusters like all the time, it's really not helping with that. Um, so then we've sort of talked about the, the overall platform. So on that picture that Danny showed of all of the things that we need to worry about around ML code, our platform really, really helps with things like uh, infrastructure, resource management, um, really helps with governance processes because everything's a bit more standardized. There's a really clear route to live. Um, it's really helpful with coding standards and running tests and things like that, but it's not the whole picture for MLOps and there's other things that we need to think about. Um, so some of those things are experiment tracking, explainability and bias detection, and then also once models go live, how are we making sure that they're still fit for purpose um, with new data and they continue to be that way? Um, so. We've also then been investigating the use of different tools for this. So for experiment tracking, really important, we want to know why did we pick these the models that we picked to go into production? Um, how did we get there? What version of the code was used? So we need to make sure that that's really clear and we have a really clear lineage. Uh, so we're using Comet for experiment tracking um, and it's got very simple API calls, so it's really easy to use and it pulls everything together in one user interface. Um, for explainability and bias detection, again, for a bank, like we have a responsibility to use fair models for a start, uh, and also they need to be explainable um, so that we, we can easily justify decisions that we make with any of our machine learning models. Um, so we're using true error for that, and it allows you to run model diagnostics. It also helps with some governance processes, get consistent reports in consistent format. So for example, several different teams will have this same format and it's a lot easier for people reviewing those models to just know exactly where to find the key pieces of information. Um, and then finally, once the models have gone into production to make sure that we can get alerts and we don't need to have someone checking pipelines every day, um, try and take away as much of the manual steps as possible. 
uh, we're using Arthur, so you can just raise alerts using that. Um, and just to describe how that sort of fits into the overall picture, so uh, on a product and machine learning product's journey from discovery to live, um, you start off with your sort of initial quick iteration, so you're using Comet a lot for that. Um, and then once you really want to validate your model and you think you're going to take it to production, um, you can use Chirera to get a bit more of an in-depth picture. And then once the model has gone live, Arthur for monitoring. And all of this is underpinned by the use of our data science platform in AWS. So we're trying to give people this really consistent tool set so everyone's unified. So overall, what have we delivered with that platform and then the rest of the tooling as well? Um, so a huge thing has been the standardized workflows. Um, that's really reduced the time to live because people don't have to wait ages for environment creation, for example. They don't have to wait ages to set up the project code and it's set up in a way that makes it a lot easier to go to production when you're ready to. Um, we've also added a lot of capability for explainability and bias reporting and auditability, which again could sometimes be an afterthought um, previous to this. And then um, we've really tried to embed that high standards of, uh, of testing and quality assurance on our code so that we're writing really good quality code. Um, which again helps increase collaboration among data scientists. It's just easier to see what someone else has done when it's clear code. Um, and, the, and the same, the, the project templates also help with that collaboration. Um, and then all of it has also helped to reduce costs um, and then increase sustainability as well. So coming back to the maturity curve, um, you can see sort of, you know, this is, we're judging this based on several metrics. Um, and, and, you know, obviously we're considering more than just these as well within the bank, um, but we've picked out some of the key ones. And I think looking at the, um, so the faster delivery of end-to-end -end solutions, you can see this has gone down from about a year to less than three months. A lot of the time saving is the, the route to life. So we've sort of front loaded a lot of the work that you might have done um, previously when you were ready to take a model to production. That might have been a model that was just trained in notebooks. Um, you know, you don't you haven't really thought about actually anything after that. Uh, whereas now a lot of that you think about it much earlier on uh, and it makes it so much quicker to actually take models to live later. Um, Part of the, the saving has been access to data. So I think some feedback from people sort of on the ground is that it's really nice using this platform because instead of uh, the previous case where you'd sort of have a new person join the team and then they'd have like 10 different systems that they need to get access to just to get started working. Now you join the platform, you get an account um, and then you automatically have the same permissions as the other people with the same role in that account. Um, but again, those accounts can be sort of, they could be for a whole team and the team all uses the same accounts for everything, or they could just be for one use case. So it's still, you do have flexibility over who you give access to. Um, and then, as I said, the, the route to live, so down from three, three to six months to less than two weeks. So that's, as I say, really the huge saving. It's a massive, massive difference. Um, and it's just, you know, we have this easy way to get from dev to prod uh, with CI CD pipelines that again you don't need to think about you don't need to create you don't need to work out how you're going to run them that's all taken care of um, so just this standardized way of doing things um, and then the self-service environment creation as well pretty amazing so over a month in some cases down to less than two hours and really reducing the manual steps involved um, and also reducing the sort of room for error in that because you know, the more manual steps, the more chance something's gonna go wrong, take even longer. Um, and then finally, just reducing the number of the different ways people are running machine learning code in that West, because uh, it, was, it was hard to tell what was going on before. It was hard for people to compare things and reuse things. Um, so this, is, this has been greatly reduced, which has really helped us. Um, so that's sort of an overall picture of how this platform is, has helped actually change things. Um, so that's everything. Thank you very much. Any questions? Sorry. We only have a few minutes. So if you guys want to share one, I would encourage.
rolling the crowd. Sure. Yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. It's super insightful to see how you guys are solving MLOps at NatWest. Um, I guess one question I had is how much of the models that you guys have in production are kind of GPU based versus CPU based and whether there is a clear direct direction towards more GPU kind of based models or CPU based seems to be potentially more than enough for where you guys are heading. Um, that would be one question. But I, would, I also wanted to, to know whether you guys have seen any limitations by having all of the infrastructure so linked to AWS um, and whether that, that is some concern to NatWest. Thank you. I guess I can answer the first question. So when I said there was around 3,000 modules in NatWest, I think predominantly they are CPU based. A lot of them are just NLP modules that were developed a few years ago. and they aren't that intensive in terms of compute, so it will be mainly CPU. We do, we have started experimenting with deep learning in the past year a lot, and this is where we've, we've been looking at optimizing and scaling our SageMaker pipelines for GPU-based workloads. Um, this is where SageMaker helps a lot because AWS has pre-built some Docker containers you can use for GPU processing. So we find ourselves scaling horizontally quite often with the pre-built containers in SageMaker. And we, because it's managed infrastructure, I, I think we, we generally don't have an issue scaling out because we essentially just say um, to the, we use the SageMaker SDK and we, we say to it, you know, we want five or six instances which are GPU based and use this Docker image to run it. So it's been really easy to, to do that. Uh, did I answer your first question? Yeah. yeah. And then the, the second one was about, um, yeah, about the, the Basically. Yeah, so if yeah. you saw in our diagram, uh, we have been using Terraform mainly because of the reason that we don't want the uh, vendor lock-in, but we have also found that for some, some things like unfortunately with um, service catalog, it wasn't provided as a resource in, on Terraform just yet, so we had to use kind of a hybrid process between the two, but yeah, we were conscious of that fact, so when we chose our infrastructure's code tooling, we, we went for Terraform and then later on, um, we are actually probably going to move even the, the resources that are in cloud formation to our form again. Yeah, but I suppose the other thing about NatWest is we are trying to move to the cloud predominantly and this is our strategic tool. So we are, uh, because of that, we are not too worried about that. I guess we, if we are to move to Azure, things would be difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, just to add to that. <laughs> yeah, I think to add to that sort of, a lot of the thing we want to think about as well is like the more education side of it. So um, we want to sort of make sure people are thinking about all the principles of MLOps and um, you know if we ever did have to change, at least they're still thinking about those things a lot more than they once were. Um, so I think that's, that's part of it as well, that they'll be less worried about it because of that, because we're still in a much better position than we were. You. Cheers for the talk. Um, I'm just curious, like, what are the problems with that? Because, um, like, I know there was a lot of positivity and stuff around, like, SageMaker and things, but, like, uh, there's still, obviously, a lot of time to get to prod and things like that. So, I know it won't be plain sailing, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I suppose. I, suppose <laughs> I mean, I, I guess when you say three months to production from inception of a project, that's re still, still a really long time, but... We do work in a bank enterprise setting where everything is so locked in that you'd be lucky, as we said uh, earlier, to get access to your data on time to do your machine learning um, development. But I think some of the problems that we've had is around educating people to use CI CD. We tend to be stuck in situations very often where people just not run their CI CD pipelines to build their code. And then they have a tool to promote their models automatically as well, but they just wouldn't use it, they'll still, you know, hand over to the platform team. Um, so it's a bit of an education piece there. And I suppose with SageMaker, another thing which you'll find a lot with managed and serverless infrastructure in general in the cloud is uh, it takes time to spin up containers. So if you write your machine learning SageMaker pipelines, you'll notice that each step takes about five to six minutes just to start up. And that adds, if you have 10 steps, that adds like 15 minutes to your processing time, which is really not ideal. I think 
um, AWS is, is doing some work on that to make sure you have quicker startup times, but that is a pain point at the moment. I think that one was really yeah. frustrating for people who were used to working you know, in a notebook, having yeah. everything ready, and it was suddenly like, oh, yeah, we've been told we've yeah. got to use these pipelines now. So I think a key thing was you should have the flexibility to work in that way if you want to at the start and then start to use pipelines as well. So part of it has been trying to say, you know, we're not prescribing one very, very set way to do it, but the option is there to sort of use all of the resources as well. Yeah, I guess the, the last thing I'd mention about SageMaker specifically is the SDK is a bit convoluted. Like the boilerplate code is so much that you probably are in a good position if you write a package just to abstract away all the parameters you need to pass to all the functions in the SDK. But apart from that, I think it works quite well. So if there are ways around it. I was just wondering what the sort of future looks like. You know, is it more of the optimization of the same or is it a slightly different path or what, what does the future look like? I think, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things, like you say, more of the same. So we're pretty early on in, uh, like for example, lots of the, the monitoring stuff. Um, you know, there's still a lot of manual steps involved. Um, we want to automate a lot more with that and make sure that we've got alerts and things. Um, the same with explainability. I feel like we, we're just really scratching the surface with it. Um, and we really want to make sure that we've ironed out any sort of kinks in the integrations with the rest of the platform. So I think that's a big thing. I guess that's a bit of a user experience thing as well. So making sure it's really smooth to use this so people actually want to. Um, I think further on from that, um, I guess we're trying to look a bit more at different types of models. So as Danny mentioned, um, bit of a push for deep learning and now uh, you know with the sort of craze around large language models which I think we're going to hear about uh, next actually um, I think you know we're trying to actually think a bit more about the types of models that we're using and um, been a bit creative with that now that we have the sort of infrastructure to support experimenting basically anything you've got to add yeah I guess just one thing I'd mention is if you saw our kind of uh, sorry our our infrastructure component there is no feedback loop between development to production so we're looking at automating retraining based on certain parameters and that is kind of connected to our uh, model monitoring so once we improve our model monitoring then we can start thinking about kind of automating the whole flow between environments but yeah hi thanks uh, again for the for the good talk uh, I know you're on the upside of things, but I'm interested in some of the successful ML use cases at the bank. What are the, what are the sort of items that have been quite high impact that you've seen? I wonder which ones we can talk about. Yes. <laughs> I, I give you permission to talk of all of them. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I think one that uh, we've, we've discussed publicly is um, we have a, a, a model that um, classifies uh, different reasons people have been calling the bank. So it uses NLP and it categorizes what people have been, uh, been calling about and what the resolution was, so that's one. Another one is kind of uh, looking at customer value over time. So over the course, course of five years, uh, what would this person's bank account with us look like and how we can kind of improve their experience moving forward. So there's been a lot of good work with, with ML and we're looking forward to kind of adopting the latest trends and using large language models going forward. Do you, can you think of any others? Yeah, I'm a bit uh, stuck with Danny. I know there's two that we've talked about before. So yeah. Okay, I would ask you, as you said, that you tend to use large language models to have a look at or even a future prediction of any customer's uh, banking history or banking journey, right? So, I mean, from your experience or from that period of time, uh, what would you say is the much more accuracy rate? A accuracy rate? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, we're, we're really early in our kind of large language models journey so far, and I really can't comment on the evaluation metrics we use, yeah. so. <laughs> but we're really 
really so stuck with early on that uh, you know yeah. I think me and Jenny especially are not really involved yeah. I think, uh, in the, uh, yeah. I that know. that <laughs> project that I mentioned earlier about predicting customer value is not a large language model, so mm-hmm. it's actually a set of models, so it's probably not useful in that context. But yeah, it doesn't help that I'm not a data scientist yeah. by education, <laughs> so I can't really comment on that. Sorry. Hi there. Uh, I think you mentioned um, in your presentation that it's taking you three to four years to get to where you are now. Do you have a sense of where you are compared to others in your industry? Um, in, do you feel that you know maybe some banks are lagging far behind, or are you all roughly at the same stage? Um, maybe if you want to come answer to this. So um, it's a bit difficult to tell sometimes, obviously, because I don't think people want to say necessarily if they are really lagging far behind. But I think. From what I've heard, I've heard of people who have, you know, find the sort of the stuff that we're talking about now is all oh, that standard, like we've had that for ages. Um, and then others who, you know, they're not really thinking about this sort of like infrastructure challenges. They're more working, you know, on notebooks. Data scientists are building models and everything, so you know, quite a manual process. So from from the leaders leaders to the laggards, there's there's quite a big gap. You <laughs> I think so. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Would you yeah. would you agree yeah, with that? Yeah. 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 Um, and I think, you know, that's exactly the position we were in a while ago. So, you know, yeah. it could be difficult to even, you know, install Python packages in some cases. Everything's so locked down because you want to keep data safe rightly. Um, but it can make it very difficult to set up dev environments. Yeah, I was just going to say you can kind of see that as well with, with products that AWS has been building for machine learning because they recently created a, a process to essentially just deploy a notebook to production. And a lot of the features that they get as requests come from big banks like us, I'm pretty sure, and other big companies. So I think it's it's really hard to tell, but I feel like the industry is moving towards making it even simpler to take a notebook to production and eliminating all the steps in between. Cool. Then. Uh, thanks again to Lucy and Danny for an awesome talk. So, um, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Pierre. I am head of product uh, innovation at LAE. Uh, so we're doing automation at large. Uh, so uh, chatbots, uh, uh, intelligent document processing, and also RPA, robotic process automation. And today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, like how large language models are revolutionizing the way we uh, do intelligent document processing. So uh, I apologize in advance uh, because um, I, I didn't think that the audience was so technical, so my presentation is very business oriented. So uh, please bear with me and you can ask all your... Sorry? I'm sorry, I'm still sharing your screen. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen, yeah. Can you see my screen? Okay. Sorry, folks, just having some technical difficulties. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think it stopped during uh, during the break. Okay, there we go. Can you see it now? Cool. Sorry about that. Thank you for being. Okay, no problem. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, my presentation will be very business oriented, uh, but at the end you can ask me uh, any technical questions uh, that that you see fit. So first of all, uh, let's move on. So what is uh, intelligent document processing? Basically, it's turning uh, unstructured documents, any type of document, into actions. So first, it's about classifying a document. So you've got, uh, I don't know, like a sheet of paper. What is it? Is it an invoice? Is it uh, like a ticket? Uh, is it a contract? What, what is it? And then when you know what the document is, the, the goal is to extract data from this document so that you can then do something about it. Once we have validated it and formatted it, uh, you can use it in, uh, like to, to build a dashboard, to perform an action in the back end. So it, it's really about taking a non-structured data, making it structured, and being able to do something about it. So uh, if we take an example here uh, of uh, like an invoice document, uh, you see that uh, from this scanned invoice, which was like printed and then scanned, uh, you can detect the, the issue date of, uh, of the invoice here. It's in 2038, so uh, it's not real data. 
Um, you've got the customer name, the supplier name. You can extract any information that you see fit uh, from this document. So this can be a very short document or a very long document. So this is usually uh, things that were taking a lot of time to, uh, to people uh, in the past, looking at all those documents and entering manually uh, things in backends so that uh, we can process the, the results of the document automatically later. Uh, but then came uh, uh, like IDP first, uh, intelligent document processing, and then large language models. And today we're here to talk about uh, large language models. So I'll, I'll start with a brief introduction of what it is. I, I assume that most of you know what it is, but I'm still going to make a very small uh, introduction to it. Um, so basically, there are machine learning models that are trained on an insane amount of data, uh, textual data basically taken out of the internet. So it's for GPT 3.5, which is uh, one of the most uh, well-known large language models, uh, it's trained on 45 terabytes of data. Uh, like if you consider that one megabyte of data uh, is, is roughly five pretty big book, you've got five million books that have been ingested by uh, by this AI. So it has read well, like all those books trying to figure out what was inside. Uh, if you're wondering how the training uh, looks like for such an AI, it's pretty similar to what you, uh, you, you can have seen in the, the film Matrix with Neo. Uh, so it's actually like getting all this information at the same time and it's just looking uh, at this information, actually trying to predict what's going to come next so for example, it's, it's reading uh, uh, like some, um, some dialogue of a movie and it will try to predict what is the next sentence said by uh, an actor. So doing that, it will be uh, uh, important for uh, the AI to have understood all the context, right? Okay, this is this person talking here, they're talking about that, this is the tone of voice, uh, this is here in the action, so it's very likely that it's gonna ask, uh, how are you today, for example. Um, so, uh, reading all this information, like books, uh, Wikipedia, uh, like any forums, uh, but also like movie scripts or code, uh, it's able to really uh, start making sense of it, uh, just like we would uh, as humans. Uh, <clears throat> very technically, it's, it's trained in, in a various number of techniques, so the, the most like important one is uh, is, is really trying to predict what's going to come next in a sequence of text, but then it's, uh, it's definitely fine-tuned, uh, so it's retrained on top of it using uh, like uh, supervised learning and reinforcement learning to make it very easy for us to use it. And this is why uh, ChatGPT is so easy to use right now. You can just talk to it like you would talk to a human, even though it's just uh, like it has just read a lot of data uh, before. So if we have to uh, like remember one thing, so what is really different with large language models to compare to uh, other systems uh, that we've been uh, talking, for example, in, in the in the last in the in the talk just before, is that in machine learning uh, the, the the biggest um, you, the, the way you train the model is is by giving it a lot of different examples. Um, and for like any task, for example, in document processing, you would have to feed in, uh, let's say, um, thousands or tens of thousands of documents, manually annotating them, saying this is what I need, this is where it is, before you can actually use them uh, in, in production. So it was taking a lot of time. So now with large language models, it's really as simple as just describing the task uh, that you want to, um, to perform. Uh, and uh, maybe giving one or two examples, but it's not more different than actually talking to an intern and telling them this is what I want, right? So you describe the task, maybe you show it once, but then it's done. So it's really, really different from uh, what we've seen before uh, in language model, like in uh, machine learning models. So it's it really about gathering a lot. So it's, it's really painful. So you need to gather a lot of documents. Uh, you need to spend your time on an interface clicking, okay, here is the date of the invoice. Uh, here is uh, the person I'm interested in. Here is the email I want to retrieve, et cetera, et cetera. So it can take like hundreds, uh, thousands of hours. And then in the end, you need also to spend a lot of time making the data readily available because for example, 
the date was in American format and you want to in ISO format, so you need to have some kind of date parsing and, and doing a lot of extra work to be able to use it uh, in the backend system afterwards. So with large language models, it becomes incredibly faster because you just have to describe what you want. I want the name of the customer of this invoice, for example. Just explaining in plain text is enough for the machine to understand what you want to do without any training. And it can also format it in any way you want. So if you want to say, uh, I, wanted, I want a summary of this and I want it in Spanish, it will like, do the summary and translate it in Spanish. So it, it, like, everything goes at a speed that is never seen before. So the main thing it's doing is that before, of course, you could automate everything, but it would take you so long. Now you can pretty much automate everything because it doesn't take any more time. Uh, of course, it almost sounds too good to be true, uh, and it, it's partially true. Uh, because, uh, first of all, talking to large language models is not really easy. Uh, knowing how you ask them the question actually matters, uh, just like you would manage an intern, but you, you can well manage the intern and it will do the job correctly, or not manage it correctly, uh, and, and it won't, it would, for example, do something that is not expected. <clears throat> it's also very difficult to actually achieve data consistency at scale, uh, because just like human, uh, if we have the tendency of uh, answering things in a slightly different way each time, so uh, to make it really uh, something that, that scale, uh, it, it takes also a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, uh, of work. And finally, uh, it's very nice like this, but what you want is an end-to-end -end process that is automated. So connecting to the system, so getting the documents at the beginning and then putting the results in, in, a, in a system can take still a lot of time. Um, and and this, is, uh, this is something that large language models can't do for you. So this is why we have built uh, DocuGuru, uh, our platform that help you turn your documents into actionable data. Uh, so to solve all the problems I just uh, talked about. And now uh, it's time for a live demo. So uh, let's go together uh, and we can pick uh, any, uh, any document. So here we're on the platform. Uh, I hope you see relatively well. I can. Uh, zoom a little bit uh, if we, you don't see. So let's start maybe with uh, a very simple document, a passport. So what it will do is first try to understand just from this image that we're giving it, uh, what type of document is it? Uh, because before uh, we know what type of document, we can't really know uh, what we want to do with it. Uh, you would think that in reality, you don't need to know what document it is because people will always upload passports in, in, in the same form, for example. Um, actually, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's more complex than that. Like in most cases, uh, people will receive uh, uh, documents through emails, for example, and people will use uh, invoice at mycompany.com to actually send uh, things that are not, not invoices. So you need to be able to check that, um, that what you have is indeed an invoice. So here we have this uh, Mario Andrea. So we didn't have to do any training and it's able to understand from day one exactly uh, what, what we want. So here it's a pretty simple document. So let's go for a more complex one. So uh, what could we have, for example, a resume? with a more complex structure. So once again, it's gonna try to uh, also detect because when you upload a document, when, because we're only giving one example, uh, maybe uh, well, wait, here it's very simple, like a resume, CV, or, um, or anything. So it can also extract things, as, as we're going to see, uh, it's also able to extract complex things like lists or objects or list of objects so that you don't have to, um, to, to do it yourself or do any kind of formatting, uh, just as you would like to, um, to see it. So here we have a simple uh, resume. 
Um, and it's taking a little bit of time. So in the meantime, so yeah, let's look at this. So here you ha we have all the educations, the graduation date, etc. Uh, we can see later, but for example, if we want this in ISO format, this is quite easy to change, right? Uh, or if we want uh, like the phone number in a specific format also, uh, it's, it's really ex extremely simple. Uh, let's take another document and let's try to build some new stuff on top of it. So let's take it like an article. Like, let's take a research paper, for example. So this is really, uh, we, we can take any type of data, uh, even completely unstructured like an article, uh, before most uh, intelligent document processing required having a structure. Uh, it's actually completely lost. Uh, this is a live demo, so this is definitely, uh, yeah. Uh, so what is it? It's a research paper. Uh, so it doesn't, it didn't recognize a research paper. So let's do, for example, we want uh, a summary uh, of the, um, of the research paper, what would we like? Maybe we would like the um, uh, authors, yeah. Is it authors? No, I'm not sure that, I, that no. okay. Should be able to work. I made a mistake, I made a mistake. So let's, uh, let's wait for it to work. So in the meantime, while I do tests, you can uh, maybe start asking questions uh, because it's, it's running. Yes, please. Oh yeah. So here we have summary and we have the authors. And uh, we could actually go and get the authors' emails maybe. This is so much work for a quick question. I'm, <laughs> the fields are not dynamically generated. They come from the templates themselves, right? So actually, uh, so we have templates, but each time that we don't recognize a template, uh, we will um, actually generate the template automatically. Okay. So it works with any type of document. Um, yeah, any, please. See across the front, don't mind me. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so behind the scenes, two questions. What um, NLP model are you using? And um, do you do a lot of prompt engineering from these direct fields to extract that information? Because I assume there's some form of like extract all of the text from images and then put that in the model. So what, what does that kind of behind the scenes pipeline look yeah, like? So we, are, we have our own uh, OCR engines to be able to extract the um, um, the, like, the text from the image. Um, and then we use, uh, today we use mostly GPT 3.5, uh, but this is not something that we have to do. And yes, definitely you have to do a lot of prompt engineering. Uh, and in particular, uh, so for example, if you wanna have a stable solution, uh, you usually, usually do, for example, prompt chaining. So you'll first uh, generate a first uh, uh, answer by uh, GPT 3.5 and then send it back to GPT 3.5 to do some extra modifications. So it's actually quite complex to make it into a stable product. Uh, this, this is not impossible and this is extremely powerful, but it doesn't work just by using the API as it goes. Like it's good for demonstration, but when you want to like do uh, like 1000 articles, if you want to have really good answer each time, you, you better do some, some very tough prompt engineering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so are you worried about therefore like providing wrong answers? Because um, I assume it's like just by definition of the models, it's never like completely deterministic. Because uh, I know like with code generation and things, like this is a big problem as well, especially when it's for like maybe sensitive information extraction and things like that. So the, the, let, let me just launch another test while we do this. Let's do a, a notice of deposition, a little bit of, um, uh, of legal term. Um, so the, 
the main difference between code generation is when you're doing code generation, you're tapping into the memory of the network uh, that has read so many different codes and you ask it to, to, to get into the memory. Here, you're actually providing to the memory uh, of the network, you're giving it the information, saying just answer using the information I'm giving you. So it doesn't have to make up the information. It has the information directly available. So the hallucination of the network comes when it's just like a human, like if I ask you some uh, very specific question about Indonesia, uh, you'll have to think about, about it in your mind. It's much harder to answer than if I just give you one piece of paper with a lot of information about Indonesia and ask you to answer based on this paper. So it really, the task of intelligent document processing uh, is definitely much simpler on that regard and you don't have such a lot of hallucination. Of course, just like human, uh, it will make assumptions. But usually this is assumptions that you want. So for example, we have handwritten notes uh, where uh, it's sometimes hard to read uh, the handwritten characters. But a human would actually use some extra information. Uh, so for example, you have an email that is handwritten, but somewhere you have a better uh, like version of, like, like you understand that the email is uh, first name dot last name at company.com and you see the first name somewhere else and the last name somewhere else. So um, the algorithm is actually capable of, uh, of finding this uh, first name and last name and understand the structure of the email to redo it in the right way. But a human for a human, like this is exactly what a human would do. So it's a little bit of assumption, but it doesn't go beyond what humans usually do. Uh, thank you very much. So we've seen lots of companies over the past year working on things like, um, you know, fine tuning a transformer model to make office tasks a little better digitally. And then we see uh, companies like Microsoft and Google sort of release very general tools that are very well integrated to their platforms. So my question is more of from a sort of business point of view, to what degree do you think it's more competitively advantageous for a company to have a general solution, such as yours where you're doing document translation, versus a specific solution that might be very niche, smaller market, but less at risk of being eaten by a big tech company with lots of resource training on a larger corpus of data for their fine tuning? Yes. So. In terms of, uh, of market positioning, our new product is not uh, meant to be that uh, general, so we have a general basis, but we do believe that the defensibility, of course the defensibility will never be on the AI part. The AI part is, is mostly shared by, uh, by everybody uh, today, so it's, it's very hard to build a new business where you think that what's gonna defend you is the quality of your AI. The quality of the AI will be the same for everybody. So we, we do think that the defensibility uh, of, of this business is really around the integrations that you create. So be, being able to, as I said before, uh, like do end-to-end -end processing, right? So because the, the, the speed at which you can actually put a new use case into production uh, is what we think matters the most uh, to be able to, uh, to penetrate a lot of, of different markets and then stay there. And once you've penetrated, uh, thanks to very easy integrations to their uh, already using tools. Uh, the idea is to start offering a lot of other services on top of it. Because uh, when you start having all your documents, for example, that are handled completely automatically, then you want to have a lot of anomaly detection. For example, I just received an invoice for $1 million. This is a very unusual amount. I want to do something about it. Or uh, this is the, the second time I see uh, uh, a contract that looks like this. Uh, there is there is something fishy here, I need to have a human intervention. So it's really about, um, uh, so first having this end-to-end -end integration so that it's super easy to use, and then it's all the services that you put on top that have nothing to do with just extracting the data that I'm, I'm showing you right now. Please. I'm, I'm really sorry, but if you have a mic, people um, remotely can't hear you, and we were just queuing up a question from a remote speaker. So if it's okay, we're, we're going to go to Damien, who's got a question remotely, and I'll come to you oh, next. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. Can you hear me good? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, yeah. Just a quick question there. Um, from the presentation you gave, the impression that I had was that you've got a sophisticated OCR, which is sort of chained with uh, a large language model with no visual awareness, like GPT type stuff, GPT three point five. You said. Um, is this a simplification? Is this how the way it works, or have you got something like a visual question answering type model or a document question answering type model where you know the um, the visual and the the text models integrated? So no, uh, so this is really in two phases. So we have an OCR that is separated from, from a large language model. So we don't have an, in, an all integrated model. Uh, and we don't think that at this stage we, we, we need it because the, um, like the, uh, just having the, the structure of the text is enough for all the use cases that we have. Uh, I'm not saying that it's 100% it's, it's there, but, um, but for all the use cases in live that we have, it's, it's definitely more than enough. Understood, thank you. No, as I said, as I said, as you, you were saying that uh, from the last chapter question, uh, some of it, that a lot of assistants, uh, especially, they're trying to get really ahead of basically, you know, trying to get uh, like large language models into their uh, organizations and otherwise, and even in front of their customers. I want to ask a really basic question. Do you really think that, I think we, uh, us uh, right now, technologists and even businesses are a little bit running too fast right now? Shouldn't we maybe uh, hold down, uh, like, you know, stand for a little bit, uh, think about how would it affect everything in society? I'm sure you know that, okay? And then and then decide on whether to go and, uh, like, you know, go and uh, grab the shiny thing. Uh, I'll, Otherwise, it can sting you. So this this is a very interesting philosophical question. Um, no, no, no. I, so, sorry. I'm saying I'm 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 basically not trying to get the philosophical side of it. I'm just trying to get the either one the technological side and obviously the. Uh, I mean, because I'm, oh, you were saying something. <laughs> So, so I'm not sure that I have understood correctly your question. So if I can rephrase, I think so. Yeah, so okay. sh are we going too fast? So yeah. th there are many reasons why we, we could have been too fast. It's like uh, it, it could disrupt a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, so are you afraid that the technology is not ready, not good enough, and people are going to break their business? Or are you afraid that it's going to change a lot of things in society and this is something that we should take uh, at, a, at a slower space? I would pace. say that uh, yeah, we should actually take it slightly slower pace, okay? And uh, one, that would be one. The second thing, I would uh, I also think that uh, we should really examine every single thing before we, uh, yeah, we should really examine other aspects, for example, societal or even that thing. Okay, so so to answer very uh, briefly on that, because I think we could go all night, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that, um, I just don't think that it's practical to go at the slower pace uh, because we've never been able to do that. Uh, there are always people advancing, so we, we can wish it, but I think it's wishful thinking. So uh, the thing is, we're not going to stop uh, innovation. Uh, I think this is uh, something that is very deeply rooted in, 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 in us humans. Uh, and mammals in general, by the way, uh, but and and this could kill us. So yeah, but we can't really stop it. So uh, it's it's very uh, it's very complex. When it comes to large language models, I don't think that there is such a big. Uh, it's definitely something very new and very big, but uh, but I don't see it much more dangerous than other things that we've seen before. Uh, so I would advise more trying to find out how do we do it, uh, like make it a good thing because it's there to stay and so we have to live with it. So let's make the best of it, even though maybe uh, this is not what we needed. <laughs> yeah, uh, just one question. <clears throat> like um, you were saying, uh, so the time templates are being generated uh, like uh, dynamically, right? Some of the templates. So, and that's happening through like chaining, uh, the, I mean, the chaining of uh, questions to GPT or? Yes, exactly. Okay. And some of the templates are already pre-built pre -built, and some of them are you are creating 
Oh, it's more like a caching system, right? If we've already generated it in the past, we'll not regenerate it. Right. So, I mean, for that, suppose it, it's uh, recognizing and passport, and it's creating a, using your uh, default template for that. Or yes, it has already like uh, created a template for passport, and so it's it's using it uh, because I've already like submitted a passport before. Like another customer already submitted a passport, so I have already a good template. That I can okay, use. so you're caching throughout your system. Yes, right. exactly. And it is like getting feedback from the customers as well? Your, your so uh, right now, no, but this is the kind of thing that, yeah, uh, knowing what templates are more useful to customers right. would be very helpful in, in, in uh, creating the product even like uh, further. Thank you. Uh, hi, so just a, a question related to the gentleman's question uh, a little bit earlier around defensibility. And more of an honest question because I haven't looked into it too much. Um, but how does your answer um, account for uh, like um, OpenAI releasing plugins and you know the um, the sort of uh, second layer um, use cases or functionality that are coming? Um, from that and you know like that that is going to cover a lot more of these kinds of solutions uh, does the you know your idea of defensibility still account for those kinds of innovations yes because um, but definitely defensibility is a very tough question for yeah, now yeah, it's a and I don't want to be an investor uh, to be honest right now because it's uh, <laughs> so if you're open AI your defensibility is not much yeah uh, right because there are a lot of uh, even open source models out there that perform well. Uh, if I'm uh, NVIDIA, uh, I'm not super happy as well because when you see what they've been able to do with Llama.ccp, uh, like the open source version of, uh, uh, of Facebook that they put into, uh, like that can work on your computer, then you don't even need uh, a lot of uh, like engineering power. So for now they're like, I don't know, like 10 very big, like 20K CPU, uh, GPUs running in parallel, but you might not need this in the future. Same, you, we, under, we start understanding that uh, sometimes like training for longer, uh, like uh, large language models can make it significantly smaller. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you're just like building chips, if you're Amazon, then you're not really differentiating as well because like Azure, GCP or all other providers will um, be able to run that on cloud. Uh, if you're a startup, uh, yeah, everybody will run uh, mm. things on, on large language models. So it's very di like, n difficult to, to know what's going to count. Uh, yeah, it's still too early. To, it's to very really... early and, and defensibility is going to be a very, very big challenge for companies in the future, any type of company. Yeah. But I think that uh, we've seen that in the end, um, I think maybe the bottleneck will be uh, people ability to adopt new things, right? So probably uh, the companies who explain the problem the best and have the easiest to use solution and uh, will probably uh, be in a better uh, like situation mm -hmm. than others because technology will not be a differentiator. So you have to come back to UX and, uh, and positioning basically. Yeah, but I, I think prompt engineering is, is definitely good. I mean, that's where the, the sort of scarcity is being pushed to. That, know, that, 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 so yeah, but yeah. prompt engineering will be another type of skills, but- Yeah, like, exactly. But a lot of people will be able to develop those skills, even though they're li like uh, data scientists, right? There will be a shortage of prompt engineers maybe at the beginning, but then, then it will be, become bigger and- uh, And then they'll be laid off from Meta. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's very hard to predict the future. But uh, and then just a just a comment more than a question uh, around that. Sorry, around that uh, um, point about moving too fast. Um, I don't think you can think about all implications. You can maybe look at second or third order effects, but even then, there's an infinite in, an infinite amount of or an infinite array of uh, implications that technologies like this try and sit down and. Think of all of those iterations before we move ahead is um, not feasible, really. So, like any technology, you know, like the atom bomb, right? Build it, blow yeah. something up. Oops, let's let's just chill. <laughs> it's it's incredibly complex, that's for sure. So, uh, have we have we been able to find a uh, 
universal universal template for the CVs? So there's not universal. So you, it doesn't have to be universal because, and this is also why our platform makes sense. Is like depending on whose customer we're talking about, uh, like they will have very different uh, like requirements, but they will all have the same base requirement. So basically, um, from this base requirement, uh, you'll be able to um, uh, to add any fields that you want. So for example, here. If I want to have the years of experience, I'll just, uh, for example, describe that I want the years of experience. Uh, I'm the first customer wanting years of experience, but um, uh, but I'm able to say that. So, for example, years of experience is like last experience year minus first experience year. Uh, if uh, last experience year is current or non uh, assume 2023. So you can just add this at the end, test it, and you have a new template that is specific to your need, uh, right? So it's just a question of making it very easy to start. Once again, uh, what we understood, like the main competition for IDP right now is, is, is doing nothing. Uh, like automation used to be super hard to actually perform at scale. So it was super good if you had like millions of, uh, of resumes to handle every day, for example. So this is, you can have your own ML pipeline, your ML engineers and, and, and tag and have like uh, 100 people tagging CVs every day, but it's, it's, it's not good if you're smaller or more specific use case. So what large language models do is that they open all those previously inaccessible use cases to automation. Uh, we have another remote question from Damien. Hi, it's me again. Thanks, Pierre. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yep. Um, so I. Lay has a RPA robotic process automation offering as well. I'm super curious about one, whether you guys have incorporated any large language models into that, and two, um, if so, <laughs> um, how you might do if you haven't. So in, in, in RPA or in, so, so can, can you just repeat on which part of the product? So, so, so with an RPA, you've got workflow design, right? And then you've yeah. also got um, the part, I can't remember what you call it, the process extraction where you ex extract processes by following people doing what they do with their mouses and their clicks and their keyboards yeah. and stuff, right? So um, th this this is the sort of area where I might imagine, but haven't got much, um, in, uh, as much insight as you for sure, into how um, how you might apply language, you know, this, this latest AI technology, large language models and things like that. Uh, I'd just be curious about your insights, whether that's, you know, um, whether you're just imagining or whether there's something going on. I'm just curious about what your thoughts are on that. So yes, uh, definitely uh, we're like doing a lot of things to implement large language models uh, everywhere uh, inside of our products. Um, so we're like all our teams and all our products start embedding large language models uh, here. So um, I, I don't have a specific example for the, for the RPA uh, right now. Of course, we have like generation of RPA code. Uh, in terms of workflows, uh, what we do is we, we have uh, an experiment running for a chatbot business uh, where you actually, uh, we, we take the website of a customer and we are able to create uh, like conversational trees from this website. So just by reading all the pages of the website, understanding the knowledge uh, and, and then creating a, like uh, a full tree uh, that we can then supplement when people have specific questions that are not the most relevant questions in the, that are very specific question in, in the, and that are maybe not present in the tree because the tree cannot, cannot like represent the whole website, then uh, it will uh, query directly the website, find the relevant information inside and then generate directly through GPT uh, the answer to the customer. Um, so just like reading and creating a graph from some knowledge is definitely something that we've been doing. Uh, when it comes to maybe analytics, uh, we have uh, we have um, 
things that we're working on around uh, like creating uh, SQL queries uh, and creating graphs automatically uh, based on, um, uh, on uh, like an intent. Uh, and knowing uh, like a database and everything, so it enables us to like create much easier, uh, or, like much more easily, uh, uh, an interface to actually read data and, and take decisions on the data. So this might be helpful also in um, in, in process mining. Uh, but uh, yeah, so those are some of the the things that we're working on. Thank you, Pierre. Thanks for that. Uh, Great product, by the way. I, I'm a complete outsider to AI, so all, all this stuff really interests me, and I think, oh, fantastic. Um, but I'm thinking about it from a sort of an individual point of view, right? If I'm if I'm applying to a job for a company, right, and they're using a product such as yours to analyze my CV, um, and you have to forgive me, I'm not sure if I have a question here, more of just an ask for thoughts. But yeah. what 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 sort of accountability do I have if if that product, for instance, analyzes my CV incorrectly, like the like the um, Example you've got there, right? Years of experience, you pulled that out of the CV. Yeah. What, 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 what would I feel as, a, as an individual if that analyzed my CV incorrectly and you know, I didn't get a job offer, right? Or I didn't, you know, the, the, the company rejected me. Uh, so again, you forgive me for not having a question as such, no, but no, no, it's, I mean, what, what are your, do yeah, you have any thoughts on that kind of aspect it's, of it's, it? It's very important. So for now, for example, what we're not putting into the, um, uh, into the product is like decision. Uh, like, should I hire this person or not? Or is this person uh, like relevant for this? So what we're doing is just extracting data. Um, one reflection I have around this, uh, one thing, uh, thought I have around this is um, we're actually much harder with computers than we are with humans. Uh, when you read a lot of CVs, and by the way, I've like probably read like 2,000, 3,000 CVs, uh, uh, usually I get tired quite quickly, and sometimes I will just not read the, the, the CV, sadly. Uh, be, but it doesn't get tired. Uh, DocuGuru never gets tired, so you, you can throw as many CVs as you want. So I think that in the end, uh, yes, we need to be very cautious about that. And I would not advise in putting uh, strategic or important like human decisions into machines. Uh, but everything that is that can be done by them, I think, uh, has the potential to be better. And, and we have to remember that we are very, uh, also we, we make a lot of mistakes. So uh, one example I have is, is on our chatbot product. So people were asking each other, so what, what do we do if, if we answer something that is uh, a bit wrong? But actually, when you look at what agents do, agents are actually being trained. Uh, they have managers that listen to the conversation and that make changes and that tell them you, you, you did a bad thing. So actually, we're at the stage where really AI has the, the, probably the knowledge and the behavior of a, an intern, right? So, but what we need to start that, um, yeah, it's, but we're actually like uh, wanting even more from, from the AI than what we're waiting for from humans, so. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I guess the, the point is humans make mistakes too, right? I mean, yes, AI presumably would make less mistakes over time. I, I guess. Yes, is that, yeah. definitely. Okay, interesting. But it doesn't mean that we should like put everything there and say uh, like it's still not knowing what to do in many cases. Document understanding is very good because it's really we're giving it the information. It doesn't have to go in its memory and, and make judgment calls. It's just doing very basic work. So very basic work. It's doing it, it much better than us. By the way, we, we did an experiment at the beginning because we wanted to test it against our own benchmarks of having uh, humanly labeled data. So at, at the beginning, the F1 score was not very good. And we actually realized that the problem was from human labeling uh, because the AI was actually looking at more subtle things. And, um, and, and definitely, so the, the data was in better quality with the AI looking at it. No questions for the room? Cool. Um, thank you, Pierre. Thanks for this evening. We have Nomi um, from Demon talking about EU legislation and AI. Thank you. Um, right, can I work this clicker now? How do I work this? I mean, I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. That's <laughs> true. Okay, right. So, yes. I'm Naomi. I'm an analyst and consultant at Demon, and I'm going to talk about the EU legislation on AI. So, just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. 
um, the approach to the legislation, how it's structured, um, the concept of explainability in AI and how the Act covers it, and how um, the legislation approaches protected characteristics. First, you know, why do we need leg legislation in the first place? Trust, ultimately, so that the user and society, they have trust in the AI, the output that it's giving, and then some understanding. And this is uh, conveyed in this quote by Margaret Vestager. So the approach to the legislation is a risk-based approach. So the risk is um, to human safety and to human rights. So it's a four-tier approach to the legislation and structure. Minimal risk, limited risk, high risk, and unacceptable risk. So explainability, um, as Lucy already mentioned earlier, uh, it's about transparency and around the AI how it's been programmed, how it's been trained, the data it's been used to train the AI systems. So this doesn't apply to minimal risk category. The minimal risk category is things like spam filters and um, AI-enabled games. They don't have much risk to the users. So these are, this is the only category that's excluded from the transparency regulations. Where it begins to apply is the limited risk. So chatbots, things that could pretend to be a human um, and will start giving outputs to humans. So the explainability um, around, for example, chatbots would be how has this thing been trained, the training um, data that's been used. So following on to the high risk and unacceptable risk, these accompany, um, or the, these help to protect our uh, protected characteristics, which are human rights and protection from discrimination. These, um, so the high, high risk, high risk AI, sorry, they are AI systems that have the potential to impact our human rights and our health and safety. So these undergo a high level of um, pre-market uh, assessments. So things like logging of activity, detailed documentation, and risk assessments. Some examples of the high-risk AI systems include law enforcement and border control migration systems. Unacceptable risk is anything that contradicts the EU values on human rights. So these have an outright prohibit, prohibition, so they're completely banned. This includes things um, as well, alongside things that contradict the EU values. It also encompasses things that threaten people's safety, livelihoods, rights. So an example of an AI system would be voice assistance that could possibly be used for dangerous behavior. So just to summarize, um, so yeah, there's a four-tier system to the EU legislation, which will be coming in soon. Currently, it's been drafted in April 2021. And as of December, the EU Council has given their uh, stance on it, and it's now being negotiated with the EU Parliament. Thank you. Cool. So that brings our talks of the evening for an end. I'm now going to try and click in the right direction. There we go. Um, our next event is on the 5th of May. Uh, and uh, same time, same place. And we've got some very exciting talks, including one from Escher Cloud. So hopefully I'll see some of you there. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. And thank you for everyone who joined us remotely. And yeah, like I say, hopefully we'll see some of you soon. Um, for those in Paddington this evening, uh, we will be uh, closing the doors at 9. So please try and aim to be out before then. But if you'd like to um, continue some of your conversations here or over the road at the very nice pub that's just down the street, please do. And yeah, once again, thank you all for coming.